Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are joining us from all over this world. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank George, uh, the primary organizer of this workshop, for organizing such a fantastic program today. He really deserves uh, you know, our appreciation for carrying the load in the logistics. Uh, today, I am delighted to be telling you a little bit about some of the work that I and my collaborators have been working on that are that is amongst the most exciting work that I've been involved in the last few years, and it's on an area known as neurosymbolic programming. So machine learning, as we all know, is in the process of transforming the way that we do science. Uh, recently, a uh, machine learning approach was instrumental in discovering a, a structurally new antibiotic called halicine, which may hopefully one day become very useful to tackling various bacteria that have become resistant to our existing antibiotic family, antibody families. Uh, machine learning has been instrumental in improving the efficiency and precision of gene editing, such as the CRISPR-ML project, that's a collaboration between the Broad Institute and Microsoft Research. Uh, as George mentioned, uh, machine learning was crucial in the design of uh, state-of-the-art protein folding technologies, such as AlphaFold, which can now yield much more accurate protein structures, 3D structures of the, of the proteins than can be done before. Here at Caltech, we've been using machine learning to personalize the gates of exoskeletons, uh, lower body powered exoskeletons, uh, with, the, with the goal of providing rehabilitation for people suffering from paraplegia. So you see in the video, uh, some demonstrations on paraplegic subjects where the machine learning algorithms are actually personalizing to the comfort and preferences of each individual subject and how they would like to move. But despite all this excitement and undeniable progress in the way machine learning is being used to transform science, you know, something's still missing, as George mentioned already. Obviously, there's interpretability, which is, you know, one of the big themes of this workshop. Uh, you know, as we deal with increasingly larger and higher dimensional data sets, and we try to extract phenomena of interest uh, for scientists, interpretability of black box models uh, becomes increasingly a bottleneck in terms of scientific understanding. Data efficiency. Although we are in the world of big data in many senses, uh, data efficiency is still a concern, especially if we're talking about machine learning methods that require annotated or supervised or labeled data, because labeling can still be a very expensive process, even though raw data is becoming increasingly plentiful. Domain knowledge. Many scientists would love to be able to incorporate various forms of domain knowledge in a way that they know the machine learning algorithm can use uh, in a transparent and useful way. So here in this screenshot, you see an example of uh, a study in behavioral neuroscience where you know, we know that the facing angle be from between one mouse to another mouse is indicative of certain types of behavior that the mouse might be uh, engaging in. And we would love to have machine learning algorithms that can transparently incorporate such types of domain knowledge in a way that's efficient for the domain expert to specify. And finally, uh, and this is a big one, uh, and one that's you know, a, a challenge that's very, very broad and much broader than what I'll be talking about, but correlation versus causation. Are we just learning correlations? Are we actually learning something causal, which is ultimately the goal of science? Meanwhile, uh, there's been another revolution, a uh, smaller revolution uh, in formal methods. And so you see this in various headlines where um, you know, software is being formally verified um, in a way that is interpretable, verifiable, understandable, and can lead to, in, in, in this specific case, a causal reason for why a piece of software has failed and therefore allowing, in this case, software engineers to fix that bug. And so uh, one area of, of this, uh, of this uh, revolution is called program synthesis. And program synthesis is essentially um, so very much like machine learning in, in the following sense. You have as input behavioral constraints. So these could be input output examples for this input, the, the, pro, the synthesized program should obey this output. You may have properties, you may have distributions over desired behaviors, and then you also have structural constraints in the bottom, such as the program components, the programming language, the libraries, the skeleton, some prior over the program structures. 
you feed all this into a program synthesizer and you get out a program or a piece of code. So this is program synthesis in a nutshell. And in a sense, it looks a lot like machine learning, uh, except perhaps a bit less structure. And I'll talk about this uh, in a few slides, the, the, the differences and similarities. And the next thing that I wanna note is that in a sense, uh, all of scientific knowledge, at least the stuff that's codified is code. Equations are code, flow charts are code, you know, diagrams in a sense are code. So all of scientific knowledge is code, in a nutshell. And we see specific examples of this where automated program synthesis uh, has been used to sort of study uh, data sets and design codes or programs or, pro or symbolic models to explain the data to, in a way that's interesting for scientists. And so this is uh, actually happening already. And so, just to summarize, on the one hand, we have these symbolic programs, which are interpretable, verifiable, uh, can relatively easily incorporate structured domain knowledge from the domain expert, and is much more data efficient than deep learning. On the other hand, we have neural networks or deep, deep learning. One of their main benefits is that they have very scalable algorithms based off uh, continuous optimization approaches such as stochastic gradient descent. They're extremely flexible and can fit very complex phenomenon that symbolic programs have a hard time fitting. They can handle mess, really messy data, such as noisy images. And they're very easy to get started with because um, of all the software support and the ease of just setting up a neural network on a large data set and getting something that does something non-trivial. So this is sort of the comparison and contrast between these two uh, areas. And I should also mention that symbolic programming is also you know, very closely related to another branch of artificial intelligence known as symbolic AI. And so what I'm gonna be telling you about for the remainder of this talk is neural symbolic programs, which bridges these two uh, uh, areas and, ho and hopefully unifies them, transcends them, and gives us something different that can help us make progress in science. So just to give you an example in behavior analysis, which is where I've done most of my uh, collaborations in this space, here you see a video of, of two mice interacting with each other. Uh, and in this, in this case, you have both the video and the tracked skeletal poses. And the goal is to classify when these two mice in these frames are sniffing. And so we can, you know, uh, uh, given data of this form and some annotations, we can, uh, we, we can give this to a program synthesis approach, a neurosymbolic uh, programming approach, excuse me, which can generate a program that looks like this. And the details of this program aren't so important. The main things I'd like you to observe is that it has symbolic structure in the form of if-then-else statements. Uh, it has these functions or functional modules, which have di differentiable parameters or continuous parameters. And in these cases, these functions are, you know, relatively structured. In some of our other uh, uh, collaborations, they're actually small neuro small neural networks that are inside of this uh, program structure. And so everything is learned in conjunction with the program structure. That's the basic idea. So neurosymbolic programming or, or neurosymbolic learning, depending on how you want to think about it, isn't new. Um, it's, you know, people have been thinking about ideas like this for a, quite a long time, but uh, I, I, my hypothesis or my, my proposal is that now is a very good time to push on this area in, in, with renewed vigor. And the reason is that there's been the respective revolutions in both fields and leading to rapidly maturing tools, both in deep learning and in program synthesis. We have an opportunity now, and this is a lot of what my core research in my group studies, we have an opportunity now to de design new algorithms using these tools as building blocks that can really scale and scaling both in terms of computation, such as uh, examples such as neural guided search, where we can design really large and complex and expressive yet interpretable neural symbolic programs. Uh, it can scale in terms of data in the sense that by imposing programmatic structure in certain ways, we can be much more data efficient than deep learning alone. And finally, uh, there is renewed demand or new demand by domain experts and science applications. Virtually all domains of science are collecting unprecedented amounts of raw data. And there is a need to have new tools that can help scientists make sense of this data in a way that 
is um, tr efficient for their time. And so this demand and this opportunity you know, is, also, is a third reason to really push in this field now. And so uh, very re recently, about a year ago, the National Science Foundation funded an expeditions computing project for neurosymbolic learning. If you're interested, you can visit the URL, neurosymbolic.org. Um, so it's a range of PIs from uh, program synthesis experts to machine learning experts to various domain experts. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of this. Okay, ultimately, once we have these neurosymbolic models, the goal is to use these as a tool to empower closing the loop between data and insight. So on the one hand, you have a domain expert that can interact with these neurosymbolic models in a, in, in a transparent way, both in terms of querying the learned models and extracting insights, but also injecting more domain knowledge to, um, to constrain the model in, in useful ways. Uh, once, uh, if you have the neurosymbolic learning algorithms that can train these models, you can, of course, fit them to the data. That's the red arrow on the right. And in some cases, it might even su automatically suggest experiments in an active learning sense. And of course, once you have these neurosymbolic models, as, as denoted by the green arrow on the bottom, you know, the domain expert can take these insights and check it against the data. And this creates this virtuous cycle where, where this domain expert can uh, rapidly iterate and prototype to refine the models to, to therefore, um, you know, quickly lead to insight that is uh, useful for, for their scientific mission. So here's the basic recipe. Um, we have what is called a domain specific language or DSL. Um, this, you can think of this as the family of programs that we would like the neurosymbolic uh, learning algorithm to learn over from data. And what I've given you here is a fairly generic way of specifying. It looks a little um, maybe like gibberish, but let me just walk you through quickly. It's, it's actually very simple once you get used to the notation. So alpha is the program structure, right? The, the structure of the program, the logical structure. And alpha is selected from the following uh, atomic or, or, uh, or, or primitives. You have the raw input. So alpha could just return the input. You have algebraic operators in this specific language, although it's not strictly speaking necessary, like um, you know, plus, minus, various other algebraic operators that's all included in, in, this, uh, in this notation. You have parameterized operators. So theta are the continuous parameters of these operators, like distance functions, affine functions, any kind of parameterized library functions you want to include in this language. Uh, they could also be small neural networks that are you know, perhaps pre-trained to have a certain uh, uh, behavior, but then you can also tune the, the parameters of the neural networks. And then you have the various symbolic, standard symbolic stuff like subset selection, if then else, uh, you know, and map average looping, et cetera. That's the bottom row. So that's a domain specific language. You, you as the domain experts specify this. And of course there are tools that make this more uh, you know, easier to do, perhaps using user interfaces. And if you recall from the earlier example um, where this, we have this program that's trying to classify neurosymbolic program that's trying to classify SNF. And these distance affine, acceleration affine functions are examples of these parameterized operators where they, they are, are functions with you know, these continuous parameters theta that's denoted in the subscripts below. So that's, uh, this is actually a program uh, that, from this programming language. Okay, oops. Um, so you, know, you have this domain specific language. Uh, just like in machine learning, you specify a learning objective or a loss function. For example, given labeled data, minimize the classification error according to you know, something like log loss or cross entropy loss or something like that. That's, fair. That's still pretty standard. You feed both of these things into a learning algorithm. Uh, this is also known as synthesis in the program synthesis community. What you get out from the learning algorithm is a neural symbolic program parameterized by the program structure alpha and its continuous parameters, theta. You provide this program to the domain expert for various downstream analysis that's of interest to the domain expert. And from that, the domain expert might suggest a modified objective function or a loss function, perhaps adding more training data, or modify the domain-specific language structure itself. And then we repeat. So this is the basic recipe. A few observations. First of all, if the program structure alpha is fixed, then you can just train the continuous parameters of this neurosymbolic program theta via gradient descent, just like in deep learning. 
And in fact, if you, you can even define alpha just as a straight up deep neural network, in which case this reduces completely the standard deep learning. Finding the structure alpha is analogous to neural architecture search, if you're familiar with that area. And so we sometimes call alpha the program architecture. Uh, classic program synthesis focuses mainly on finding this alpha with the continuous parameters in the, in the library being typically very simple or non-existent. And so this is the sense in which neurosymbolic programming really tries to inherit both uh, the structure uh, and, and the semantics of both deep learning and symbolic program synthesis. So for the remainder of this talk, I think I have about, let me just check the time, um, maybe about 12 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to give you three vignettes, just a few minutes on each. One is on an algorithmic vignette, how this new class of models requires new learning algorithms, which is the, 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 the technical work that many members of my group uh, engages in. A user study vignette where we partner with domain experts to help use these tools to build models that they can use for downstream analysis for their scientific mission. And then a data augmentation vignette, which um, studies how do we can use these tools to provide increased data efficiency for, uh, for, for uh, standard machine learning. And so let me just start with the uh, first one. So the, an algorithmic vignette. So, um, and this algorithm is a very, if you're, if you're a computer science, if you have a computer science background, this algorithm uh, is a very standard algorithm in discrete search. It's called top-down induction. So you have uh, a, a program that has a hole in it and all, and, and all holes are denoted by the star or asterisk. So here's a partial program. It just says, takes, it, takes an input X and then does something. I don't know what it is. So this is called a partial program. And then, and then you can use this to define a search space. So this is a very, this should be very familiar for people who have who've done top-down inductive combinatorial discrete search. You could either return nothing. So this is a, this is a trivial program that, re, that, that replaces the whole with just nothing, a no-op. You could return an identity function. You could, uh, you know, inductively or, uh, you know, create more logical structure with more holes in it. So here's a map function with a hole in the, in the map function. And then you could, you know, recursively search. So this is a gigantic search space. And in some cases, you can complete the whole with a, uh, with a fully completed program, which may have some continuous parameters, uh, such as a small neural network, in which case you train the continuous parameters using gradient descent. So this is what top-down induction looks like that requires both discrete search over the program structure, as well as continuous optimization over the parameters of the program, uh, of, of the program it, that was found. And of course, there are many different branches and you, know, you just sort of uh, search over all possible ones to find the one that minimizes your learning objective. And so this is an exponentially large search space. This is, you know, this, this, you, you, you face the same problem in neural architecture search where you're searching for neural architectures. I know for top-down induction, a popular approach, uh, you know, such as A star search, uh, they require what's known as an admissible heuristic, you know, or, or a way to, you know, bound the, the cost to go as, you, as you're performing top-down search in order to, you know, do much better than brute force search. And so one of the motivations that we, that, that, or motivating observations that we've been using a lot in our algorithm design is the fact that um, these neurosymbolic models in terms of representational power are, are, are strictly, are typically strictly less expressive than large neuro, purely neural networks, right? For any input output behavior that a neurosymbolic model can capture, it can also be captured uh, in terms of input output behavior by a large and purely neural network model. We call this uh, a, a neural relaxation. So every neurosymbolic model can be approximately represented by some large neural model. Using this neural relaxation idea, we can now design an admissible heuristic uh, based off neural relaxations. So in particular, now we have this, now we have this top-down induction. Here's our current uh, uh, state of the search problem. And we have this hole in this program in this, in this branch of the, search, of the search tree. And you could literally just fill this hole with a large neural network and see how well you can fit the data. If a large neural network cannot fit, fill this hole well, then a, 
then a symbolic neural symbolic program that completes this whole also cannot because the neural network is strictly more expressive than the neural symbolic program. So we train a large neural network and try to see how well we can fit the data. And this is easy because it's continuous. And this is one of the reasons why deep learning is so scalable. So this step is typically very easy. And if it's not good enough, we prune it away. We, have, we now have a lower bound on the cost to go or an upper bound, if you will, on the cost to go. And this is the neuroadmissible relaxations idea. And you can incorporate this, uh, you, then you can interpret this exactly as an admissible heuristic. You can incorporate it to any informed search algorithm, such as A star search, and you get you inherit all the convergence guarantees of A star search. And so here's just one result where we are doing program induction using these differentiable programs. Um, and um, you know, the bottom left, this is a learning curve of wall clock time versus a learning cost or some, some notion of complexity cost. Because we because we want simpler programs that are also accurate, that's what the y axis is, and you want to be as close to the bottom left corner as possible. And the takeaway is that this approach offers an order of magnitude speed up compared to more naive program structure learning approaches, which is very exciting. Oops. Okay, so um, the second vignette is on um, a user study vignette. So how do we sort of think about down, using these kinds of ideas for downstream analysis. I, I should mention that you know, this, these works are you know, still in their early stages. And so I'm really excited for the progress that we're making and, and where we're headed. Um, but this is just sort of a, a flavor of what we've done already so far. And so this uh, user study vignette is motivated by the idea that, and this is a real problem, by the way, in behavioral neuroscience, that behavior categorization and definitions are actually ambiguous. What you see on the bottom is a taxonomy, uh, uh, incomplete taxonomy of uh, mice behavior. And, and, and I should also mention that mice behavior is social, so it could, may involve interaction between two mice, which makes it much more complicated. And designing this taxonomy, designing the boundaries between this taxonomy, looking at video frames, which is continuous time series of data, and then deciding when a certain action is happening and when it's ending, you know, it's all very ambiguous. And when a domain expert studies behavior, uh, 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 domain, behavioral neuroscience in, a, in their research project, they have to, you know, for example, provide labels of, of the videos and their labels may or may not even agree with each other. And so it can be hard to sort of uh, compare studies across, uh, compare results across studies because these definitions and categorizations and labels are not completely consistent. And so motivated this idea, we, we thought, okay, no, we could actually try to use neurosymbolic models to explain annotator differences. So you have, you know, the, in this case, uh, for this particular study, you have this one video that multiple annotators annotated according to their you know, internal definitions of these behaviors. And then we use program synthesis or neurosymbolic learning to design simple interpretable programs that can explain the differences uh, between uh, these annotators. And here the, the domain specific language or DSL incorporates a, a, a continuous family of, li uh, of functions called Morlet filters as part of uh, its library, which we found to be ver a very interpretable way of modeling these behaviors. And so you get out these pr relatively simple programs. You have three example ones on the right of the, on the right figure. Uh, they can get a little bit more complicated, uh, of course. And I saw as you mentioned that this project was led primarily by Megan, who was an undergrad at Caltech, uh, and she will be applying for PhD programs this upcoming uh, winter. You know, we can also incorporate uh, these um, the, the the outputs of these neurosymbolic programs as well as expose some pieces of the neurosymbolic programs and incorporate it into user interfaces that are actually in data analysis tools that are used by behavioral neuroscientists today. So this is the Bento system. Um, that's used for uh, behavioral neuroscience, and we are in the process of integrating and exposing pieces of the neurosymbolic program into this interface so that the scientist can really um, dig into this data in a way that you can't simply cannot do with uh, pure deep learning alone. Okay, so the last thing that I want to just briefly talk about is a data augmentation vignette where we want to improve, improve the data efficiency of learning. So uh, you know, data augmentation and related ideas such as self-supervision, weak supervision, pre-training, et cetera, is extremely popular in deep learning right now um, because it is a very uh, 
practical way to improve the data efficiency of deep learning. Here you see an example in, in, in analysis of images, which is the most common place that this happens, where you, you take the original image, which is the image of a dog, and you apply various transformations on the image that preserve the meaning of the image. It doesn't change the label dog uh, in, this, in these particular cases. And now suddenly what you had one labeled example, now you have 10 labeled examples in this, in this specific case. And so these augmentations reduce the label burden. And so inspired by these ideas, you know, we thought, how can we, you know, do this for science? And, you know, the, the, these data augmentation tasks, they, they tend not to be very useful for many scientific domains, such as behavior models. And so what, um, what we did, and this is led by Jennifer Sun, who was a PhD student here at Caltech, um, is we, at, we asked domain experts to help us design programs that capture interesting attributes of the data, such as you know the distance between the facing angle between the two noses of the of the two subjects, in this case two mice, and so you see here a program that the domain expert has written. We could of course also synthesize these programs automatically, but to start with, we'd simply ask the domain experts to spend just a few minutes of their time to write these programs that inc incorporate interesting attributes, and these become decoding tasks, auxiliary decoding tasks that you ask a neural network to try to uh, decode. In addition, uh, in addition to its primary learning objectives. The idea being that if a, if a neural network can decode these, these attributes, then you know, it's learned something semantically compact that is useful for downstream prediction tasks. And indeed, this is the case. By writing, only, by writing just 10 simple programs, which takes a few minutes of the expert's time, uh, you, we see here that it can lead to a factor of 10 improvement in label efficiency. So, Labeling it requires a domain expert, like a biologist, to look at the videos manually and annotate them manually. And we can get the same performance in classification with just these using these auxiliary tasks as 10x the amount of labels. So we've basically saved, you know, potentially you know, tens of hours or hundreds of hours of labeling time from the from the biologist in this particular scenario. Okay, and in follow-up work, we're looking at how to automatically synthesize um, these pro decoding tasks via unsupervised program learning. Okay, so I'm almost done. I just want to briefly mention that you know this is only possible to just, to understand what actually makes can move the needle in science by close collaboration with scientists or domain experts. And in the behavioral neuroscience uh, applications that I've been most focused on in this space, uh, that's primarily been with David Anderson, who is a professor here at Caltech, and Ann Kennedy, who is a new professor at Northwestern University, previously a postdoc in David Anderson's group. And we're studying more than just mice, of course. Um, you know, David's group is now studying jellyfish, which is in the top, and in the past, they've studied uh, fruit flies or Drosophila. Um, we are actually in the process of writing a survey paper on neurosymbolic programming. Uh, it's almost done, so keep an eye out for it. It's coming out soon. And that's it. So I, I, that, I hope I've convinced you that this is a very promising and exciting direction to study. We are in the process of designing new algorithms, looking for new collaborators, um, designing new uh, sets of libraries for various domains. And if, again, if you're interested in more information, you can visit neurosymbolic.org. And that's my talk. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Isang. Um, I see there is one question in Q&A um, stream. Uh, so what does the downstream analysis of the neurosymbolic program involve? Um, so there are uh, two. So, so first of all, of course, you know, it, it really depends on what the domain expert is looking for. But if you, um, if you look at, let's say, um, yeah, something like this, um, you know, you, you see the video of the behavior, you see in this case, uh, I know it's a little bit hard to interpret, but, uh, you know, for the domain experts, the, this is the stuff they look at on a regular basis, uh, you see uh, we're actually exposing different pieces of the neurosymbolic program on the right, and we're correlating it with, the, they're, they're correlating it sort of in, by, by, by with the video, and from this, they get it, they can extract insight from the, uh, from the uh, what the model has learned. This part, this piece here is not too different from other visualization projects that people have studied in the past. The main thing I want to point out here is that the neural symbolic programs is very compatible with this workflow, and so this integration is very natural. 
And so this exact this workflow here, you know, is is you know something that I'm sure George has much more experience than I, I do. But my point here is that these Norsenbach programs make this a lot easier. Um, another question is how causality can be incorporated in neurosymbolic programming pipeline? That's a great question. Uh, I don't have a real answer for you. Uh, it, it's one that I'm extremely interested in. Um, I'll just maybe say a few thoughts and then keep in mind that these thoughts are kind of vague and speculative. Um, uh, but um, these programs are some of these programs are, are generative models in the sense that they say they, they, they say they predict what will happen next in the world if it, given these inputs or in these initial conditions. What that means is that if this truly did capture some causal aspect of the world, then you can use this program to reason about counterfactuals. What will happen if this condi initial condition were different? And from that, you can work with a domain expert to see, can we actually do, do an intervention in an experiment to test uh, that hypothesis? And you know, of course, this is no different than possibly doing this with deep learning, where you, know, you can modify the inputs and then the outputs change. But the symbolic nature of the programs may help lead to um, more confidence in, in the fact that we have identified something that could be causal. But of course, this is still uh, quite speculative, and we hope to make progress on this in the future. And let's just do one more question. Has this ever been combined with probabilistic programming to actually probe causality? That's a great question. Um, my collaborators uh, on this NSF project, uh, uh, Kevin Ellis uh, and Armando Solar Lazama, they are actually uh, experts in probabilistic programming. They're experts in program synthesis and formal methods in general. So they've done actually quite a bit of work in probabilistic programming. I, I will say that uh, to date, most of that has been purely symbolic. And also, sorry, excuse me, Swara Chowdhury has also done quite a bit of work in probabilistic programming. I will say that to date, um, most of that work is purely symbolic. Um, and we are actually in active discussions about how to you know, combine, joint, combine those ideas and do probabilistic program, neurosymbolic programming. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Yisong.